Friends, as we continue our joy series this morning, we're going to be turning our attention to gratitude. We've already talked about gratitude a little bit as an antidote to envy, but today I want to talk about gratitude as an important pillar of joy. So the YouTube video that we just watched was posted by Forest Hill Church and is titled Christmas Presents. And I love it because it offers a perspective in which everything is a gift that creates surprise and wonder. Can you imagine living your life that way? Think of all the things that we take for granted and even feel entitled to. It certainly doesn't help that the human brain has evolved with a negative bias. Psychologists have known for a long time that because of our evolutionary biology, we tend to focus on what is wrong, dangerous, and lacking. And that was important for our survival early on. And when we put these two things together, it is easy to see why we become blind to all of the wonderful gifts that we experience every single day. In the Book of Joy, Archbishop Desmond Tutu explains how changing our perspective can make a positive difference in our lives. He says, and I quote, perhaps people will be moved to see that there are many in the world today who will not have had the kind of breakfast that you had. Many millions in the world today are hungry. It's not your fault, but you woke up from a warm bed you were able to have a shower to put on clean clothes, and you are in a home that is warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Now just think of the many who are refugees, and this is a crisis right now given what's happening in Ukraine. Imagine the refugees who wake up in the morning and there's not very much protection for them against the rain that is pelting down. Perhaps there is not warmth or food, or even just water. And in this way, Tutu is encouraging us to count our blessings. You guys remember that old song, count your blessings, name them one by one? Wisdom teaches that this is a really important practice when we are trying to resist the negative bias of our brains and vices like ingratitude, envy, and greed. If we want to experience enduring joy, it is a practice that we need to do not occasionally, but every single day so that gratitude can become our attitude, so that it can become our way of life, our way of being in the world. One of the most counterintuitive things that we learn from the Bible and our own experience is that happiness does not make us grateful. Rather, gratefulness makes us happy. If you want to experience deep and lasting joy, it is crucial to get this point and let it shape the way that you live. Again, happiness does not make us grateful. Because as soon as we get what we want, and experience a little bit of satisfaction, we are already looking for the next thing that we want and do not have. And there's just not enough time to experience deep gratitude between fulfillment and the reigniting of desire. In contrast, if we choose to count our blessings in any given moment of our life, if we choose to be grateful, it has a way of increasing our happiness and deepening our joy. And this means, and this is good news, this means that we have some control over whether or not we're going to be happy. Because we always have choices. We can choose to celebrate what's going right in our lives and count our blessings, or we can choose to complain about everything that is going wrong and focus on what we want but do not have. As we think about all of this stuff, we may be surprised to discover that choice is at the heart of gratitude. I want to say that again. You guys awake? Choice is at the heart of gratitude. 
Every moment that we are alive is a gift because no one is promised tomorrow. Every moment is precious because it contains opportunity, possibility, and choice. And this means that we can choose joy even during times of great suffering. Now, this may sound strange and even offensive to some of you, especially if you're going through a hard time right now. And to be honest, I used to cringe at the phrase, choose joy. Just ask Emma. This was a popular phrase that uh, came in, out of some uh, uh, speakers in women ministry, and I would hear this phrase, choose joy, and I would just cringe because I took it to mean when things are going bad, just brush it under the rug and pretend that everything is good. And if this is the way that we think about choosing joy, then we should reject it because it is dysfunctional insofar as it prevents us from seeing, accepting, processing, and resolving our problems and pain. However, after studying the nature and practice of joy, I have come to understand this phrase in a different way. The idea of choosing joy can remind us that we always have choices regarding what we will focus on in any given situation. And what we focus on tends to multiply. Just test this out with your own experience. If we focus on what's going wrong, then more things tend to go wrong. If we focus on what we want and do not have, it increases our dissatisfaction. It makes us less fulfilled. In contrast, if we focus on what's going right, then things tend to get better. And if we focus on the gifts that we already have, it can deepen our sense of gratitude and fulfillment. Of course, this is not a magic trick, and I want to be very clear. I am not teaching the law of attraction as contained in self-help books like The Secret. I'm not teaching that. Because again, even when things go sideways, we have the freedom of choice. If you know that to be true, somebody say amen. Even when things go sideways, even when things go terribly wrong, we still have choices. We can choose how we will think about our circumstances and how we will respond. And the way that we respond can either help us or hurt us. For example, there are ways to respond to our suffering that can inspire others and cultivate empathy and compassion, which will help us to become more like Jesus and to be of more service to others, especially those who go through something similar. And when I think about this idea, I think of Brenda LeBlue. If you knew Brenda LeBlue, you know that as she struggled with ALS, she remained positive every step of the way, and it inspired me so much in my own ministry to be a better man. In addition, we can either see our enemies as obstacles to our happiness, or we can see them as our greatest spiritual teachers. Just let that sink in. We can see our enemies as obstacles to our happiness or as our greatest spiritual teachers because they are people who give us an opportunity to practice the teachings of Jesus so that we can become more like him and experience abundant life. Have you ever prayed for patience and then God put an annoying person in your life? Right? You got to have an opportunity to practice, folks. And the promise of the gospel is not that we won't suffer, but that we do not suffer alone and that God will redeem our suffering and that ultimately we will experience abundant life, which is to say true joy. A joy that can be shared with others, but that no one can take away. And a great example of this can be found in the story of Anthony Ray Hinton. You may have seen the movie about his life, Just Mercy, or read his memoir, The Sun Does Shine, How I Found Life and Freedom on Death Row. In 1985, there were three separate 
armed robberies targeting fast food restaurants in Birmingham, Alabama. Two managers were killed in the process and one survived. The surviving manager picked Hinton in a photo lineup. He was arrested and given a racist public defender who provided woefully inadequate counsel. Even though Hinton's boss testified that he was at work with him during the times that these crimes were being committed, the jury ignored the testimony, convicted him on two counts of murder, and sentenced him to death. He appealed to higher courts twice and was denied. We now know that he spent 30 years on death row in a five by seven foot cell in solitary confinement for a crime that he did not commit. And in the process, he watched 54 prison mates walk the green mile to the execution room. This was painful because while incarcerated, he became a counselor and friend to these men, and not only to these men, but also to the prison guards who begged his lawyer to get him out. The Supreme Court finally released him on April the 3rd, 2015. And if anybody had a right to be angry, <laughs> if anybody had a right to hold a grudge, to be resentful, to be unforgiving, to be ungrateful, it would seem to be Hinton. But when interviewed by the popular show 60 Minutes and asked if he was angry, Hinton said, no, I have forgiven the people that sent me to jail. He explained, if I am angry and unforgiving, they have taken the rest of my life. Showing us how people can choose joy, even in the most horrible circumstances, he said, and I quote, the world didn't give you your joy, and the world can't take it away. You can let people come into your world and destroy it, but I refuse to let anyone take my joy. I get up in the morning, and I don't need anyone to make me laugh. I'm going to laugh on my own, because I have been blessed to see another day. And when you are blessed to see another day, that should automatically give you joy. And I just want to read the remainder of that quote because it's even more powerful. He says this, I don't walk around saying, man, I ain't got a dollar in my pocket. I don't care about having a dollar in my pocket. What I care about is that I have been blessed to see the sunrise. Do you know how many people had, a, had money but didn't get up this morning? So which is better? to have a billion dollars and not wake up, or to be broke and wake up. I'll take being broke and waking up any day of the week. I told the CNN interviewer in June that I had $3.50 in my pocket, and for some reason that day, I was just the happiest I'd ever been. And she said, with $3.50? I said, you know, my mom never raised us, to get out there and make as much money as we can. My mom told us about true happiness. She told us that when you are happy, then when folks hang around you, they become happy. I just look at all the people who have so much, but they are not happy. Yes, I did 30 long years, day for day, in a five by seven, and you, have got some people that have never been to prison, never spent one day or one hour or one minute, but they are not happy. I ask myself, why is that? I can't tell you why they are not happy, but I can tell you that I am happy because I choose to be happy. Does it make sense now? <laughs> Even when it seems like all of our freedom of God is gone and all of our choices have been taken away, God can help us to see possibilities and choices contained in each moment. Even when it feels like finding a needle of joy in a haystack of trial and tribulation, joy can help us see the good things in life 
and elevate it right before our eyes. And understood in this way, joy does not depend on what happens to us, but is a grateful response to the opportunity contained in each moment. I want to say that again because it's so important. Joy does not depend on what happens to you, but is a grateful response to the opportunity in each moment. Now, some people are skeptical of this view because they think that it will lead to a Pollyannish perspective on the world and undermine the pursuit of justice. But scientific studies show otherwise. In a research project conducted at the University of California, Davis, professors Emmons and Zong found that grateful people do not ignore or deny negative aspects of life, but they simply choose to appreciate the positive as well. They say, and I quote, people with a strong disposition toward gratitude have the capacity to be empathetic and to take the perspective of others. They are rated as more generous and more helpful by people in their social networks, and they are more likely to achieve personal goals. And all of this suggests that gratitude does not demotivate us. Rather, it tends to increase our motivation to work for change in our personal lives and in the world around us. And that, my friends, is good news. And so I want to end this morning by doing a gratitude exercise. And so I want you just to take a deep breath. Just take a deep breath and let it out and just relax into the presence of God for just a moment. And I want to invite you, if you're comfortable doing so, to close your eyes and to try to get an imaginative picture as I explain how blessed you truly are. If you'll do that with me, say amen. So close your eyes and go on a journey with me that starts with the presence of God in this place right now. Feel God's presence. Breathe in the Spirit of God and breathe out thanks and praise for the gift of life that God makes possible. Get in touch with your breath, your beating heart, your conscious mind. Give thanks for being alive today. Now give thanks for all the gifts that God provides as we recognize and receive His presence. Think of forgiveness and healing, fresh vision, a new way of life filled with love and peace, hope and joy, friendship and support. Now give thanks for the person sitting next to you and how they enrich your life. Now think of all the people in this sanctuary who came to worship with you this morning. Think of all of the people who got here early to lead you in worship, to help make your life better, to connect you with God's present. The band, picture their faces in your mind. The volunteers at the soundboard, the volunteers behind the computers and the live stream console. Now, Think about how you got to church this morning. What made that possible? A nice car? Maybe a generous friend that picked you up? Think about the place from which you came. Your house or condo or apartment. Think of all the comforts that this place provides you. Shelter from the storms, air conditioning, doors that lock for safety, the view out your window, 
clean water to drink and warm water for showers. All of the appliances that make your life easier. Open the refrigerator door. Open the pantry door. Look at all of the food. Look at the comfy furniture, the warm bed, the soft sheets, and the people and pets that live with you. Now think of all the things that have made this possible. A conscious mind, an able body that allows you to get up and move around to be productive at work. Give thanks for the job that has provided for your family or is providing for your financial needs. I'll take another deep breath. And as you breathe out, just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Friends, I could go on and on because we have so many good things in life. And what's interesting is that they're all connected just as we are all connected. We are all connected in a web of abundance. And if you want to improve your mood today, if you want to tap into some joy and experience some happiness, I invite you to continue this exercise at home and see how many more connections you can make. My guess is that you could probably come up with four or five times more than what we've done this morning. As the old song says, count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Amen.